to increase the probability of success, it's passion for the business, having significant discipline, and working your tail off. You know, it's always the, the people who were in the earliest and stayed the latest always made more money than the people who didn't. And the guys who didn't always said, well, what the heck does he or she do when they're in that early? And what the heck are they doing when they stay so late? And we'd always say, we have no idea, but we know they're making a lot more money than you. One path is a long, winding, unpaved, back-breaking, bumpy, miserable road to a place called success. The other road is straight, paved, smooth, comfortable, and that road ends up in a place called failure. Welcome to the show. I am Kyle Matthews on the Matthews Mentality Podcast, where we dive into the mindset of the world's most driven founders, CEOs, business moguls, athletes, and entrepreneurs. Each episode will turn our guest wisdom into practical advice that will help you build a deeper understanding of what led them to success and the mentality behind what got them there. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Matthews Mentality Podcast. Today, we are joined by, it says, a top sale. I would say the top sales broker who has been selling investment properties in New York City since 1984, Bob Knackle. It's generally accepted that Bob has brokered the sale of more properties, I think close to 2,300. Is that is that right? I'm getting there. And north of $21 billion in transaction volume in New York City, more than any individual agent ever. Bob started his real estate career in 1984 at Colwell Banker, where he met Paul Massey. They later formed Massey Knackle. After 26 year of years of successful years, Massey Knackle was acquired by Cushman Wakefield in 2014. At Cushman Wakefield, Bob acted as chairman of New York Investment Sales and was the top originating investment sales broker there in 14, 15, and 16. In 2018, uh, you left Cushman and joined JLL and currently leads the private capital group for JLL in New York. I tell anyone who, when Bob comes up in conversation, I said he is the real life Gordon Gecko. So I'm going to ask you a question. Does Blue Horseshoe really love Anacott Steel? I think Blue Horseshoe does love Anacott Steel. And I, I'll tell you, it, it's great to be here, Kyle. Happy to be on the show well, and uh, a fan of the show and uh, very happy to be on. Well, we are we are big fans of you. I uh, appreciate you coming to Nashville, coming to our little town. And I know I was with you in, in, in your your little town of uh, New York City a month ago, so I, I appreciate you reciprocating that. It was, uh, it was awesome. Um, you and I had dinner last night. It was about 8 o'clock. I... You know, like, hey, let's go back up to the office. I left something up. We came up. Most of the guys were still here, and uh, they started just blowing you up with questions. And I think I said, hey, don't feel the need to sit here too long. And would they have you here till like 9.30? About 9.30. And it, I tell you, it was impressive. It was impressive that they were all still here at 8. And uh, I felt like if I didn't pull the plug, uh, we could have gone for another couple <laughs> they of hours. Uh, they abused the privilege. Uh, and, then, and then you were kind enough to do a little – a little breakfast with them at 6.30, and and that was great, so uh, much appreciated. Uh, I was thinking about how we first met, and I'll tell the story, but I actually want to start by saying how I first heard about you. So I was I was a young agent. I just entered the business um, at the company I had started at. We went to New York. We were doing training in New York at the Roosevelt, of all places, and uh, I was sitting next to the guy who sat next to me in training was uh, a new agent in New York who was going to specialize in multifamily. And, you know, we were just sitting there and uh, there were 60 agents and they kind of, the, 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 the managers who were doing the training say, look around, you know, in five years, only two of you will be here, be left. And that was like their, you know, their flex. But I remember thinking like, well, that's not necessarily a great reflection of the training, but they were right. There was only two left. It was me and the, the, the young, the young guy next to me, we were both 22 sit next to me uh, five years later. And he did, he did multifamily in New York. And I was asking him questions at training, like, you know, how's that like? And he's asked, ah, it's really tough. It's a extremely high barrier of entry. And he said, there's, you know, there's one company that really has been dominating the space for years. And, and they're our stiffest competition is Massey Knackle. And, you know, I, that was the first I heard of you. So this was 2004. And then, you know, I had heard of your name and obviously you and Paul starting the firm. And then what was it about maybe not even a year ago, did you get, you know, what I would define as more active on social media? Yeah, January 1st. And, and for years, Kyle, people were after me, hey, Bob, you should get on social media. It's great. There are a lot of advantages. You'll get business. Uh, you'll get more well-known. Uh, and you have great stories to tell. You've been through a lot. 
And I really uh, did not think it would be a worthwhile endeavor. And, you know, finally I broke down and January 1st, I said, you know, I'm going to give it three months, see what happens. Um, I hired Mo Regalado to, uh, to help me with, you know, I write all my own content, which I, I do religiously because I, I don't want folks to think other people are creating the content. So I, I write every word, but Mo does all the posting. She does all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, she's been fantastic. And I've just been absolutely blown away by the, the efficacy that social media has, the benefits that come out of it, the relationships that you make. Um, it's really, really remarkable. And I think you have to um, mix it into your routine in a way that doesn't get overwhelming because it can be overwhelming. Um, but you just have to find that right balance as with many things in our lives. Uh, and uh, used in the right way, it is extremely effective. It's producing business. It's creating relationships that uh, I wouldn't have had otherwise. And I'm a huge fan. I, I, I got a question. I was going to ask you this later, but it, it, that's actually a perfect setup. Uh, young agents, many of them new to the business, one, two, three years in, ask all the time, like, hey, should I be active on social media? And, I, you know, my answer, and I, I, I'm asking because I want to hear your opinion, was, look, social media as a news aggregator, as a way to stay informed in terms of a, a broader spectrum of news, uh, it's fantastic. But I said, my opinion is that you got to give the world a reason to value your opinion before you start giving the world your unsolicited opinion. You have given the world, definitely within commercial real estate, a reason to value your opinion, your advice, your postings, your musings. You're like, hey, this is what I do for this, or this is what I did for that. And it's like, well, that's Bob Knackle. I should listen. What if you're a 24-year-old who's closed you know, 10 deals? Should you be out there just just posting unsolicited advice at all times, or you, should you be more focused on making calls, going on meetings, and pitching deals? Well, I, I think it's, again, a combination and finding the right balance. I don't think that um, less experienced folks should be uh, proffering an opinion about something. I think it, it's more like when you're making a, a prospecting call. The, the, the point that you want to get across is you want to offer something of value. And... Um, so when you're making that call, you want to be sharing something that the person you're talking to is going to find valuable. And in the same way, I think if you're if you're a younger person and you're posting something on social media, it should be something that the reader should get value out of. Uh, I think that it is better to give an opinion once you have the uh, the background and or experience where people might take your opinion a little more seriously. So I don't know that I'd be offering opinions at an early age, but I certainly yeah. would be offering things that I think people would find of interest. If you're a market expert in a, a niche and you have some information that probably other folks don't have, that is a great thing to share with people because it shows that you have expertise, that you might have might have insight that somebody wants to, to get from you and may call you, and that can help move your career forward. Um, but to just start opining about things um, when you, you don't have the, the track record to back it up may not be as well received as you yeah, think. Better said than what I said. I, but uh, in addition to being a news aggregator and or following people who's, whose opinion like yourself that you probably should listen to, it, it is, it, I, again, the advice I have for young, it, it, it allows for access to those people. You know, people are surprisingly more receptive to uh you know to a dm or or a reply to a tweet than if you actually emailed now nothing's ever going to replace a phone call but uh but sometimes they'll say hey like perhaps you actually can access mentors or incredibly uh, accomplished professionals within your industry and and it seems like you've you've made yourself very accessible to to the industry by way of your your social media activity yeah it's, it's an opportunity for young people to learn a lot too I mean, I, I've been around for, I'm in year 40 now. I learn stuff when I, I see things on social media. So, um, you know, it's always, as brokers, I always say we have two main assets, our knowledge and our time. And uh, you're, you're always growing your knowledge. You're always learning things. To this day, every day I'm learning something. And uh, social media is just one of the avenues through which you can increase your knowledge base. So 
you say every day you're learning something. I, w- I want to start with that. Is what does a typical day or week look like in the life of Bob Knackle today? Okay. Well, typical week is uh, is fairly standard in that uh, you know I disaggregate our activities into activities when you're working in your business uh, and activities when you're working on your business. And the the in your business activities are making your prospecting calls, uh, talking to clients, pitching business, negotiating deals all the, the nuts and bolts of what we do to try to earn commissions. Um, and then there's the working on your business component, which um, is uh, formulating strategies and tactics, trying to get to where you want to go ultimately. And um, a lot of the working on your business is done on the weekends. Uh, I think it's time when you're not in the whirlwind of, of trying to get deals done. And you can think a little more clearly. So I work on my business on the weekends. I also do a little working in the business on the weekends. And then, you know, every day is different, as you know. Uh, I'm an early riser, as I know you are and your your whole company is, which is, is very admirable. You know, to come in here at 630 this morning and see, the, you know, 30 guys sitting at attention waiting to, uh, to chat was awesome. Yeah. Generally, I'm up around 5 o'clock in the gym by 530. Um, if I'm doing a, a, a strength related workout, I can't do anything else but the workout. But if I'm on the cardio, you know, whether it's uh, on the bike or the elliptical, I'm generally doing emails or social media or something else. Uh, and then you get to it and it's uh, same old thing every day. How, I try. how is your day or week cha- today changed, if at all, from let's say when you were, you said you're 61, 31? It really hasn't changed all that much. I've, I've always had a focus on prospecting, um, doing it a little more deliberately today because there's so much going on that if I don't allocate time two weeks in advance on the calendar, there'll just be no time to do anything. Um, you know, I have an executive assistant that, that books my calendar for me. And the first thing I do two weeks in advance, I'm blocking out two and three hour chunks of time to make my prospecting calls. And she knows she has to schedule around those. If I didn't have that time blocked out, my day would be filled every day and I wouldn't be able to be proactive, which, you know, again, in the brokerage business, you can be proactive or you can be reactionary and you got to be proactive. We we, we say, yes, we are on offense at all times. You got to stay on offense. Mm -hmm. We also have a phrase for the time blocking Depending on the, the 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 time zone the office is in, it's this is not complicated. We call it call time, and the leader of the office goes out and says, "All right, it's call, it's call time," and everyone kind of puts the cell phones away and you know closes out the Excel and the underwriting and the you know comps, and they uh, you know, say, "You got to you got to you got an appointment with your future business," you know, and uh, so you're still you're still ripping coldies, huh? All the time. Well, it's prospecting and, and they're not cold calls anymore because the yeah. overwhelming majority of people and if I'm they calling, were they know you now because your social media right yeah something like that but uh you know i i think that um most of the people that i'm calling i've spoken to before or have met so they're not cold calls but they're prospecting calls and uh prospecting calls are the gasoline that drives the engine and i i am a big believer in the fact that Making prospecting calls will increase your income significantly. Most people, believe it or not, I don't. I believe most brokers do not have an active prospecting plan. Um, and if you've been in the business for a while, you can get by. You can, and you can do really well even. Uh, but I don't care how much you're making. If you're making ten million bucks a year and you're not prospecting, I think if you adopted a prospecting program, you could make twenty million dollars a year. Yeah, because it's not just servicing the business. It's always like where's your future business going to come from? And just relying on annuity business, you know, that's to your point. And if you're young, you don't have annuity business. Yeah, well, it's filling the pipeline, right? The, the, the transaction process is a pipeline. From the time you find out somebody wants to sell, you look at the property, you do the BOV, you give the presentation, you get hired, and then all the things you have to do in the middle of the pipeline to get that transaction executed, and then you get the contract signed, you have to see it through to closing. If you are just focused on one transaction throughout the whole pipeline, you've closed it, and you haven't been prospecting, you're starting at zero. So you have to constantly be putting stuff in the front of the pipeline in order to maintain um, a steady flow of business and to also eliminate the biggest problem in a commission-oriented business is volatile income. Mm -hmm. And it's always going to be volatile, but if if you're prospecting regularly, every day you're making your calls, 
the volatility in your you income stream it. is going to be a lot. Yeah, less. you can mute the volatility. I the analogy I've always used is uh, your business is a bathtub and the drain is always pulled, and so the water is always going out. Which is like when you close a deal, you know, you get a check, but you, that's it, right? And so in terms of your your business, you always got to be putting water in faster than it's draining out, and the, the you can never plug the drain, you know. Uh, speaking of business, I, I normally I'll ask, I'd, I I kind of asked uh, this question towards the end of the conversation, but you're 61. You've been very successful. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into it deeper, the Massey Knackle sale to Cushman and, and the, the very seminal moment in your life, but financially a very big moment. You, you're very successful in terms of just production. Again, I'm not going to put your business out on the streets, but you, you've done very well in commercial real estate brokerage. Most people, if they were in the room, they're going to ask this question. Or most people, I like, they're like, "Well, you, you know, you work so you can retire one day. Why aren't you retired?" Well, it, you know, it was um, the sale of the business forced me to be introspective, figure out what I wanted to do, um, and um, you know, I thought about what I really enjoyed, uh, what my goals were, what my work life balance. Um, uh, ideal would be. And, you know, it occurred to me at that moment that um, selling buildings is not just a career for me, but it's also my hobby. I, I truly do love it. And um, some people may think I'm crazy, but I there's nothing I like more than getting a list of people to call and phone numbers in front of me and just banging the phones and talking to people and meeting with them. And I think it's the greatest business in the world. So uh, I said, you know what, I could, I could invest in real estate now. I could slow down a little bit. Uh, if anything, um, I have uh, been re-energized by a number of things. Uh, working with my broker coach, Rod Santamassimo, is one of the things that got me refocused on fundamentals, and it kind of rekindled my love for the business, um, doing new initiatives of stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm like the least technologically oriented person you'll ever meet. Like I'm happy my cell phone goes on in the morning, uh, but I'm now uh, adopting AI and using AI applications on data sets I've created. And this stuff is all like really super exciting to me. I, I love it. And, um, you know, I, I work, I sell buildings. I, um, I spend time with my wife and daughter, which are my priorities in my life. Uh, I work out, I go to church. And other than that, I'm just, I'm selling buildings. And, you know, if I tell people, if my wife and daughter went on a girl's weekend away, I would work all weekend. So that's, it's what I love to do. And that's, uh, was a realization I came to that it's a, it's a job and a hobby for me. But I was going to say with respect, it's, uh, most people, the way they'd use the word work all weekend, it's an obligation. It's a chore. It's like, I have to do this. Um, what's that saying? You know, it's if you find something you love, you never work a day in your life. So I understand the the verb of like I would work all weekend, but it would almost be you saying, "Hey, I if my wife and kid go out of town, some guys they play golf all weekend. Some guys because that's their hobby, that's their passion, that's their enthusiasm. Some people would work on their old classic car, or whatever it is. Yeah, work, work to me doesn't have a negative yeah, connotation. Say, yours is, it's a, fun. Is, a, is an enthusiasm, is a passion, it's a love. It's fun, and what it boils down to, really, and, and what where the rubber met the road for me in, in this decision-making process was that I, I absolutely love winning. I've always been competitive. It's, oh, I've always played sports as a kid. I played baseball through college. I played basketball. I was always playing street hockey or do, you know, doing something with the guys. And I'm extraordinarily competitive. Um, and real estate brokerage creates opportunities to win all the time. Getting somebody on the phone, getting a meeting, getting a listing, yeah. signing a contract, closing a deal. All these wins, you know, everybody talks today about this dopamine rush that you get from different things. I think I get a dopamine rush from these wins in the brokerage business, and I, I just think it's great. What's the biggest... If you, if you got a bunch of young brokers listening to this conversation, which I'm sure we will, what is the biggest win in that continuum of brokerage? Is it the call? Is it the meeting? Is it the pitch? Is it earning? Is it getting the call that you won the business, or is it the execution and close? I, I think I think there there are two times that are are tied. Uh, one when you either call somebody or they call you and they say, "Hey, I, I'm really thinking about selling my building." 
that to me, I get a real rush. That is yeah. the coolest thing. Uh, and that's how I know I still love the business because when I was a kid, those those moments were like great, like winning the Super Bowl, scoring the goal in overtime. It was like that was awesome. And I get the same rush today from getting contracts signed. Uh, closings, although closing is the moment at which you actually make money, is, is relatively anticlimactic yeah. uh, today. But I think the finding out somebody wants to sell, and I, I guess finding out that you got awarded the business probably is is up there too. But then getting the contract signed, that's that's the highlight of the process. Yeah, surprisingly, when because we're in the same business, um, is the closing was always there was a satisfaction, and, and it was more of a relief, if anything. It was. For me, it was um, it was getting someone to agree to meet, you know, from a cold call like here's here's the purpose or here's the value of the meeting, and then it was it was getting that phone call, hey, you 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 got the business. Yeah, you uh, described it perfectly. The closing is almost more of a relief because only something bad can happen. Yeah, right. So if if the deal doesn't get sidetracked yeah. and it does close, you're relieved. Everything else, but getting mm-hmm. the contract signed, especially. You know, in New York, the overwhelming majority of our contracts are hard deposits. So you have a hard deposit when the contract is signed. You know, unless the times are really horrible, the 99% chance that deal is going to close. So it is a little bit of a relief when the closing does actually occur. So let's go back to, did you did you grow up in New York City? I grew up in northern New Jersey, northern actually. New Jersey. A little town called Maywood, a uh, small town. It had about 14,000 people when what I lived was, there. What was that like? Uh, like, um, uh, kind of like Mayberry RFD, you know, it was small town, New Jersey. We didn't even have our own high school. Uh, we went to Hackensack high school, which is a neighboring town. Uh, we had one commercial street where all the stores were, um, this was before Walmart came in. And uh, no, no Walmart, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. no Walmart there. And still have a group of seven buddies. We all went to kindergarten together, get together once a year to play poker. Um, two of those guys are uh, Jimmy Ventura and Pete Morgan, two of my my best friends to this day, and uh, it was it was real quintessential small town living. And and what um, as a kid you you said sports. What was your sport? Baseball. Baseball number one sport, but I also played basketball. I played basketball through high school, uh, but I played baseball through college. And where'd you play? Where would you go to college? Uh, at the Wharton School at Penn. Oh, I think I've heard of that. Talk to me about getting into that school. Oh, that was a that was a great thing. Um, you know, I uh, I had an attraction for business. I thought business was neat. Um, I thought uh, you know going to Wharton would be a great thing. Uh, I played baseball at Hackensack High. My my high school baseball coach Dave Seddon's brother Bob Seddon was the coach at Penn. Um, so that was kind so of a leg had, up to the, get me they in. Had the inside track, yeah. and I have to say, I, I wasn't the uh, the valedictorian at well, Hackensack High. I was going to say, so uh, I, I, I think in the absence of baseball, I don't know that I would have attended. Uh, I was going to ask, ask, could you get into Wharton today? No, uh, probably not. Yeah, probably not. But uh, you know, and the Ivies don't give athletic scholarships, so my folks had to pay. And uh, but I, I got in. I'm ninety nine percent sure I got in because of baseball. I had decent grades, but I was was not in the top ten percent of well, my class. Well, how would you describe yourself as a kid? Hmm, that's interesting. I would say uh, uh, love to be around friends, uh, loved sports, um, dove in head first into everything I did. Um, I guess you know they say. Uh, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing well. I think I, I kind of adopted that in uh, my schoolwork, uh, in my hobbies, in my athletics, and um, you know had uh, had a lot of friends growing up. And Social, yeah, very very much so. Competitive, um, pride of ownership, perhaps. And you said whatever you did, you kind of. Wanted to put your stamp on it. Yeah, I wanted, uh, you know, I I did something. I wanted it to to turn out well. Why do you think you were like that? You know, my dad was was a high school principal, started his professional career as a science teacher, then became a vice principal, and then a high school principal. Fortunately, not at my high school. I was about to ask. Yeah, fortunately, no. The high school principal at Hackensack, his son was in my class, and it was horrible for him. I can only imagine. So uh, I'm glad that uh, I didn't attend my dad's school, but my dad was uh, an educator. My mom was a housewife. Um, To my dad, uh, academics was everything. He really didn't relate to the the sports. but um, 
nonetheless, sports was a huge part of my upbringing. And, um, you know, always, always wanted to succeed. Always wanted to be really good at what I did. Your dad didn't understand sports more of an academic but was he supportive of your sports like he would go to your games and all that yeah absolutely he was they, well he um he would rarely go to my games as in little league my mom attended the games all the time i feel um, like culturally it wasn't as big of a thing back then for parents to be at games but yeah and plus my dad was working so yeah. he couldn't go to the game so mom mom would uh, come to the games and you know, my dad did see me pitch a couple of games uh, in college. Um, Were you a pitcher? My, my senior year, I was a pitcher, and, you know, we grew up in northern Jersey, so when we played Princeton, uh, he came to that game. I still have some pictures from that game, That's which cool. are very meaningful to me. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was uh, he, he uh, understood um, my love for sports but didn't really understand sports. But uh, I think the biggest – thing that my dad had to get over was the fact that he and my mom saved up to put me through Wharton, and then I took a commission oh, job. I'm, I'm, I trust me, I got that, <laughs> I got that question coming. Uh, what, uh, we, as a pitcher, what, were you, what was your pitch? What was your go-to? Well, you know what? In high school, I had a, a good combination of a fastball and a curveball. I had a, a pretty awesome 12-6 to curveball, uh, so that was, that was my out pitch for sure. And by the time I got to college, uh, my fastball wasn't nearly competitive. Uh, so I was kind of a junk baller. I still had the good curveball, <laughs> but I developed well, a good slider. And threw, at the time, I threw what I thought was a fork ball, but actually was a split-fingered fastball before it was called a split-fingered fastball. Yeah. yeah. I was going to segue, what is your pitch style now that you're in real estate? Are you a, are you a junk pitcher in real estate? No. Oh, I, ho I hope not. I you're, hope that's not the you're, case. You're, no, I mean like... I hope I'm throwing heat right down yeah, the middle. I was going to say, just bringing the heat. Yeah, you're, you're the guy who gets with the owners like, you have to sell. If you don't sign this contract, you're making a big mistake. That's it. That's it. No, I, I'm not a high-pressure nah, salesperson. I, I, consultative. I, yeah, no, I, I think that um, it's very difficult to sway an owner to do something that they don't really want to do. I think our job as, you know, everybody, every broker wants to be the quote unquote trusted advisor, right? So I, the, the approach that, that I've taken and that we always taught our folks to do, pretend the, the seller is your mom or your dad. What advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. Lay out all the options. Give, try to give the pros and cons of what each of those options represent and let them make the decision for themselves. I think if you, if you are able to convince somebody in that moment to do something that they really don't want to do, again, we sell real estate. We're not selling stocks, so it's not push the button and the trade is done. There's a lot. There's weeks and months that go by between saying, okay, yeah, I'll sell, and the time they actually sign the contract, they're going to revert back to what they really want to do. So I don't think it's sticky when you convince someone to do something they don't want to do, and then months later they have to really decide whether they're going to do it or not. So I think we want to be consultative, give advice, give the best advice we could, give the advice you'd give your folks if they own the property, and lay out the, the ramifications of each of the options. Let the owner decide what they want to do. And I always tell people, look, I'm going to be around. I've been around for a long time. I'm going to be around for a long time. I don't care whether you sell today, next year, or 10 years from now. I want to represent you when you do want to sell. And that, that has worked very well for me. Yeah, you got to make your client's interest your interest. It's hard for young agents because they telling someone not to sell. It's just like, well, I'm going to lose that deal. It's like, yeah, but you get a client. Yeah, Kyle, you know what? Some of the best relationships I have with people are people who I initially told, hey, you shouldn't sell your building now, and here's why. And they've always come back. I agree because they're so used. To, they're used to brokers. It's probably the first time they heard that <laughs> candidly. Um, before we uh, before we get into how you got into brokers, because it's a great story. Um, when did you realize you weren't going to be a professional baseball player? Probably after junior year in college. My sophomore year, I had a great year. Um, in fact, I think my sophomore. ERA, I'm still number four on the all-time Penn Baseball low That's ERA list, which Penn Baseball goes back to 1865. So mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of folks throwing the throwing the cowhide um, in that time, but uh, you know, happy to uh, happy to be on that list. And junior year, 
um, was a decent year, but not great. And then, you know, I was interviewing for jobs the summer between junior and senior year um, and starting to think about what I wanted to do. I was doing my third summer at CB. I was going into New York interviewing with the, the New York office because I kind of knew I wanted to try to give it a go in New York. And um, I just, my senior year, I, I played ball, but my head just wasn't in it. I was mm -hmm. thinking about getting out of school and putting a but, tie on. But baseball was like, that was your love, right? Absolutely. And so, uh, I don't, you know, it's kind of morose. It's like, so the dream had to die. Like, was that, was that hard? No, not really. Not really. I mean, I had, I, after high school, I had tryouts with the Reds and the Phillies. And, you know, I, of course, every kid dreams about being in the big leagues. Who wouldn't? Um, but, uh, you know, I was, I was good, but not good enough and came to terms with that. But my love of baseball, I think, uh, is so um, intertwined with my professional life. I, 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 you know, as a kid, I'm a little league pitcher, eight years old. I'm writing down my stats, my pitching stats, and keeping a log of my pitching stats and collected baseball cards as a kid. You, you still keep a log of your stats. Uh, do we have one in the room? Oh, we don't have one? Bob's got... Do you have one on you? Uh, not on oh, me. Oh, we'll no, have to get I, it later. He has, Bob has a, what is it, eight and a half by 11 eight trading eight by card of Bob Knackle, investment sale, professional investment sales broker. And on the back, yeah, right there. Yeah, so we'll, we'll put that up on the video. On the back, it has his stats. It's it's incredible. It's it was I, I, re I remember the first time I saw it, one of our guys in the office was like, hey, you ever seen this? I was like, no, but this is awesome. And it, it had it going back. So clearly a stat guy. Yeah, and that was that comes from the, you know, as a kid collecting baseball cards. I looked at the stats on the back of those cards, and that was, like, so cool to me. And um, I think that's where my my love of stats in real estate came about. And I, I have stats going all the way back to 84 when I started in the business and I'm still using some of those stats today coming out with some new things that we're doing and updating some older uh, reports that we I gotta, have. I got to go back and look at my stats, and uh, we can compare them. But uh, you're at Wharton. What was your major? Uh, uh, economics. So you wanted to be an investment banker. Well, every kid at Wharton wanted to be I know, an investment banker, I know, I was going to say. Right? And, and what was the year? Is 1984? 1981. 1981, okay. Um and you kind of wanted to be, I, I know I touched on this earlier, but correct me if I'm wrong, you wanted to be the next Gordon Gecko. Yeah, without a doubt. Without it. I mean, you, every Wharton kid wants to go to Wall Street and, you know, become uh, super wealthy. And uh, I did as well. So eat, spring. Eat, eat steak tartare for lunch. Yeah, something like that. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so I, I drove around um, Bergen County. Um, uh, spring break my freshman year, dropping my resume off at every commercial bank and investment bank I saw. I had a list of them going around. And I'm in Hackensack, come out of a Payne Weber office across the hall. I see Coldwell Banker. I'm like, oh, great, another bank. I yeah. go walking in. This is, I, when you told me this story the first time, I was dying. Like, Coldwell Banker, that's a banker. Yeah, I give them my resume. Uh, later that day, they call, hey, we'd like to interview you tomorrow. Um, so I need to find out about this bank so I know a little something about it. I haven't seen any of their branches go to the library, look up the bank, see it's a real estate company, almost don't go on the interview, but they're the only ones hiring college kids for the summer. Took the job, loved it, um, went back my next two summers and then started with CB in, in New York when I got out of school. Was it CB at the time? or At the it... time, it was Coldwell Banker. It, it iterated several times yeah. in those first few years. For, it started as Coldwell Banker. Uh, then when Sears spun off the commercial business, it became Coldwell Banker Commercial. Um, and then when they bought Richard Ellis, it be, oh no, then it went from Coldwell Banker Commercial to CB Commercial. And then they bought Richard Ellis, it became CB Richard Ellis, and then it iterated to CBRE. Interesting. Um, so you, you started in a Manhattan office? Yes. And how long were you there? Uh, about four years. Started uh, first day of July 16th of 84. And, Tell me about uh, your first day. Uh, first day, showed up uh, very early, as they're probably a little after six. Uh, I get off the elevator on the fourth floor at 437 Madison. The lights are out. The door to the office is locked. I'm like, what the heck do I do? I sat on the floor. <laughs> I sat there waiting for somebody to come. 
Uh, sure enough, Paul Massey comes off the elevator. Uh, I say hi to him. He opens the door. Go and sit in the waiting area for, for the boss to come in. Uh, comes in, says, hey, look, you know, Massey just got out of a training program. Follow him around. He'll show you where everything is around here. And at the time, CB had 60 guys leasing office space, uh, 20 people in their retail leasing division, four people in investment sales, three of whom had 20 years of experience. Uh, and then Paul, who just got out of a one-year training program, day two on the job, um, we say, you know, these guys with 20 years of experience aren't going to spend a lot of time with us. No. Let's just work together, split everything 50-50, see how it goes. And that was the, uh, the very serendipitous start to a 30-year partnership. What, what, was your, uh, what was your life like those first couple years in brokerage? You yeah, know, was, and I know we kind of touched on it. You're like, hey, it's not all that different than today, but were you working seven days a week? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was working seven days a week. And in those days, you were really working, uh, meaning you had to be in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, no cell phone, no computer, no fax machine. You left the office. The minute you stepped out of the, out of the office space, you were not working. So, so you got in it, again, you, you correct me, I got in at 6 most days? I, most of the time, by the time I got to the office, it was about 6.20. I took the first bus out of northern Jersey because I lived in my dad's house when I started. Mm -hmm. First bus, I think, was at 5.15, 5.30 in the morning, something like that. Got into Port so Authority. So were you waking up at 4.30? Something like that. Um, and uh, uh, got, uh, got to Port Authority around 6, then had to take the E or the F train. To, uh, to the office, to 53rd in Madison, walk down to 49th in Madison. And, um, you know, some days uh, I'd be there first, some days Paul would be there first, but we were always the first two in the and office. How late would you stay? Um, usually I'd stay till about uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Okay, so you were, you're at the office 11 hours, or sorry, what, the, the 12, 13 hours a day? Like, yeah, something like that. That was that was par for the course, and you know, it didn't put in that many hours on the weekend. The weekend yeah. the day was probably you know six hours, seven hours. But uh, I think the first seven or eight months that I worked, I worked every single day. Why? Uh, wanted to be the best. I wanted to learn the business. I wanted to, I wanted to get ahead. I wanted you know it's that 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 whole feeling of hey you know if you want to do this. You got to really go do it. You know, you got to put everything you have into it. And, um, you know, I just, again, I loved it from day one. I loved researching properties, putting maps together, um, making calls, meeting with people. It just, it was just great. spoke to you. We, we touched on earlier some of the characteristics of, of you as a kid. So it's, it's just more of that, it sounds like. You know, it's a, a, almost a manic approach to something you love. Yeah, I, I think it was, um, you know, uh, as part of it was wanting acceptance. Um, acceptance from who? From, uh, from your peers, uh, from uh, the folks that you cared about. It's, um, uh, you know, wanting to um, be appreciated for hard work. And I think, you know, I think my folks really appreciated the effort that I put into the things that I did and showed me that. And I guess that gave me a very positive feedback. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that's a good trait for a broker actually, because what, what you want is you want your clients to think you did a good job for them. And so I think that's something that uh, spurs me to want to do a good job for the clients is make them feel like, hey, Bob, you know, you, you did a good job here. That's great. I think on Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, right, the basic needs, air, food, water, shelter, but right below that is, um, I think, the, the feeling, the desire to be appreciated. I think they call it affirmation or something. Mm -hmm. So would you say that was a, a drive? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And it, um, the effort you were putting in the sacrifice you were making, it made your parents proud, and that was very important. For you? Yep, absolutely. You and my mom never got to see me uh, 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 in the professional world. My mom passed away uh, at the end of my junior year in college. Um, and uh, so, you know, dad was around and again, very uh, not pleased that I was taking a job with no salary. <laughs> 
uh, after the, the after very I, expensive after Wharton been education. A, been a jock, you know. Uh, that's it. That's it. So, um, yeah. you know, but he uh, he kind of got uh, got on board. Did he get to see you later in your career when you really were hitting your stride? No, no. Unfortunately, Dad passed away in 1991. So it was after MK was formed, so he got to see that. That's, and that had to have been good. Yeah, the first time I, I knew that my dad was really happy about what I was doing, um, I think it was in 1986, um, Paul and I did a, uh, a full-page ad in the Real Estate Weekly newspaper, and it was about a dozen tombstones and it was, you know, thanking our clients for a great year or whatever and all these tombstones. And I brought a copy of the... Um, what were the tombstones? Were the tombstones like the deals? Yeah, the deals. They, you know, hey, we sold this property at this address to this person for this price. So it was all the tombstones. Brought a copy of the air to my dad, uh, dad's house, gave him the copy of the paper. Uh, next time I went out to see him, it's framed and hung on oh, the wall. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, a big moment. Especially uh, an academic saying, wait, okay, first you play baseball, now you're getting into sales. Like, what the hell? <laughs> we, yeah. Where's um, that salary check, kid? Yeah, especially because, uh, you know, a lot of times what drives someone into the academic field is security and safety, you know, in addition to it being a calling of sorts. Would, uh, but uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Uh, one older brother. One older brother. What'd he do? Uh, he's an investment banker. Okay. <laughs> Went to Wharton. <laughs> That's great. Yep. So he's the real life Gordon Gecko then. That's it, something like that. Very good. Did you ever? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you offline. I was gonna say, did you ever, did you ever get him to invest in real estate? You know, do some deals with him. But uh, all right. So you're you're at the uh, Colwell Banker, then CB CBRE, whatever iteration it was mm -hmm. when you were there. You're working seven days a week for the first you know year or so. But even then, what do you say to, or what would you say to younger professionals who are coming out of college today, where whether it's just the culture or it's something messaged to them at college, there's more of a focus on like, hey, it's not just about work, it's about other things in life too. Um, and in and, and looking back at your experience that you, you know, you, you're now, you get, you get the benefit of perspective, right? Would you, um, what, what do you say to those people who's, you know, is, who talk about maybe a more balanced approach to life up front? Yeah, well, I, I think work-life balance is something that's different for everyone. It, it's probably the most challenging thing if you think about um, you think about how you want to handle your career, your personal life, your health, your faith, uh, your friends. Um, it, that that is a very very different um, calculus for everybody. And uh, I think the best way to figure out what the right balance for you is, is, you know, there's this exercise you go through where you, you uh, pretend that you died and you have people from different aspects of your life eulogize you and you write the eulogy that you want them to write about you. And that actually creates a blueprint for your life uh, and tells you the way you want to live your life. Now, that being said, if you want to be really successful in the business world, um, I don't think you have a work-life balance in the first 10 or 15 years. Um, Do you hear I, that? 10 to 15 years, not 10 to 15 days. <laughs> I, no, I think you have to go all in. Look, there, there are thousands of people wanting to do exactly what you do. Thousands. How are you going to be, be different? How are you going to differentiate yourself? How are you going to get to the top of that pack? And if you want to achieve great results... You have to make great sacrifice. And, you know, it's not something that happens overnight. And I think you, certain things have to, you have to sacrifice. And um, what were some of those things you sacrificed early on? Well, g hanging out with your friends mm -hmm. and, and relaxing on the weekends and going to the beach and playing golf and doing things that are fun to do. But, um, you know, I thought, putting yourself in a position to be very successful professionally was more important to me than doing those other things. And looking back now, would you, are you glad you did that? Yeah, there, there are times, there are times I think, and I, I'm, I'd say this only joking because I'm very proud of the fact that I went to Wharton College. It was a great experience, a, a life experience. But there were times I really think, you know, 
I, I wish I had just gotten out of high school and gotten my license. I'd have four more yeah. years of sales under my belt. Yeah, you know, we've, 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 sometimes we'll have interns and, you know, they come to us at the end of the interns like, I want to do this. You know, it's like it's what a rising junior, their sophomore becoming a junior. Like, what should I do? And I'm always like, drop out of school, save the tuition, and let's get started. And they're like, for real? I was like, no, out of respect to your parents, I don't think I'm supposed to give that advice. So, you know, go get your degree, get your license. You know, you can work part time if you're close enough, but enjoy college. I think college is, you know, it's not just the degree, it's the development and, and the relationships, of course, especially at, at, a, at a school like Wharton. But um, so you're, are you starting to get momentum four, four or five years into your business? You're starting to close sales. Uh, was it was it um, was no, it a we, slow start? Was it a fast start? It was a pretty decent start, actually. We it took nine months to close the first deal, our first sale, fourteen twenty one Third Avenue. I still remember three million one hundred and fifty thousand dollars sale. That's a good first sale. It was a good one. Twenty thousand foot fr vacant furniture showroom building. Six on points. Eighty fourth Street. No, the fee was. Um, one hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars. I don't know what that works out to, Six. but um, yeah, it was uh, it was a great deal. I, I felt on top of the world. It was the same feeling I had. I remember freshman year at Wharton. I was a little intimidated by the school, and the first test I got back was my Econ one hundred and one test, and I got a B. And I felt like it was said, the greatest I thing. And I, I I can do this. I can uh, handle this Wharton thing. In the same way, we closed that first deal. I'm like, hey, I can do this. I can, I can sell this. buildings. And we actually we we had a lot of traction right off the bat, and mainly because we were working our tails off. And um, we had CB had people coming in to New York from all over the country to sit with us and see how we were doing, what we did, uh -huh. and then. Um, after two years, we were made the bosses of the investment sales group, which really pissed off the guys with 20 years of experience. Sure. But we, we were really doing well, had mm -hmm. a lot of traction. And uh, so it was, uh, it was something that uh, developed pretty decent traction off and, the bat. And four or five years in, what was the catalyst to saying, you know what, I think I'm going to go start do my own thing. I'm going to start Massey Knackle. What had us first think about it was, and it, it happened in 86, so it was two years in. Um, you know, CB was operating on a platform in investment sales where there were guidelines about how things would be shared. We had territories, how things would be done, and uh, there was a transaction that one of the more senior guys got with a couple of properties in our territory and went to the boss and said, hey, I'm not bringing these kids in on this deal. And the boss backed them up and said, hey, guys, I know we have these rules, but we're going to abandon the rules. But when you had generated a deal in, in that person's market, you had to bring them in. Absolutely. Got it. So we, it upset us. So we said, you know what? Let's get out of here. So we, we, we were going to start the business in 86. We, we walked down to Chemical Bank. We're like, hey, we need a $500,000 loan. Where do we sign? And, of course, our banker is laughing at us and says, no, that's not the way it works, guys. You have to go start your business. You have a three-year track record. Come back, talk to us. <clears throat> Maybe we'll, we'll give you a credit line or something. And we were depressed, went back to the office. And for two years, we were saving money out of every deal we did. Paul and I had basically had breakfast and lunch together every single day, dinners most days together. And... Every morning, he'd pull out his pen, and we'd write down the list of deals we had under contract and how much we were going to make and how much we were going to put aside, save the money. And that, that actually saved MK because had we started the business in 86, um, by the time the SNL crisis yeah. hit, our burn rate would have been a lot higher than it was. We started November of 88. Our burn rate was only 15000 a month. And so we were able to make it through the SNL crisis by the skin of our teeth on credit cards and getting a loan subsequent to that. But had, if our burn rate was 25000 a month, we never would have well, made Well, let it me perfect. ask you, I think you had mentioned there were multiple times as the founder of Massey Knackle, you guys almost went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Was it, you know, one of maybe SNL? Uh, yeah, SNL crisis was a very, very tough time, uh, and that lasted a while. You know, the stock market crash in 87, the market in 88 was still really good. That's why we started the firm. Uh, it didn't really start to slow down until 89. Uh, and then back in those days, lenders went through the foreclosure process, which took two or three years, took title to the properties, then started selling them. So 
you know, the market started to pick up again in late 92 and 93 when the RTC was yeah. making these these banks sell stuff. And, um, you know, that was a, the first kind of big boost the company got was selling all those uh, REO properties what, for banks. What was going through your head? You're, you guys are hundreds of thousands into credit card debt. You have this. No, we had no. We had um, uh, about sixty thousand in total credit card debt. Inflation were, adjusted. Hundreds yeah, of thousands. yeah. It was it was a lot, but <laughs> I mean, back then it was getting a two thousand yeah. dollar card from this bank and a three thousand dollar card from that what bank. What was going through your head? Like, uh, did you did you have tremendous anxiety at the time? Um, not that I remember. Wow. I, I and not that we were comfortable with it. I mean, it wasn't a comfortable thing to be in, but we we believed that we were doing the right things and that it would work out. And, um, you know, we got to a point one time where the, the $60,000, which was four months of carry, um, was maxed out. And we had nothing under contract and had to get a loan, uh, which we did. Uh, a guy named Jack Holler, who was Paul's stepfather-in-law, had a mortgage brokerage business in New Jersey. We borrowed $75,000 from him, uh, offering him 25% of the stock in the business after we went to one of our clients and asked for 75000 He said he'd give it to us if we gave him 50% of the stock in our business. So we offered Jack 25%. He gave us the 75 said, I don't want the, the 25% stock. Someday you guys are going to be very successful. You'll be upset you gave me the stock. Um, so we uh, eventually paid That's Jack. That's very, very nice of him. I thought, unbelievable. I thought, I thought it would be he didn't want the liabilities. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Did, did you ever hear that story about the third founder of Apple? No. So there's, there's Jobs and there's Wozniak. And there was a third guy they invited, and they gave him, I think it was 10% of the company. I could be wrong about the numbers. And he was an attorney. And so he had 10% of Apple. But he would handle the legal, the, you know, the creation of the entity and all that. So he created the entity, he registered him and all that. And then they had just signed, a, you know, like a, guarant a guaranteed contract for all these computers to advance. And he got nervous that he was the only one who had assets or any type of net worth. Jobs and Waz had nothing. So he was nervous that... If they couldn't perform on the contract and sell these, you know, computers that they swore were better, they would come after him. And so the day after, it was like the day or two after he had received his ten percent, he went in and he said, "Guys, I'm out. I'll give it back to you. You know, the legal work you could do for free. Gave back ten percent of Apple, which ended up being worth, you know, whatever, eighty billion dollars." Decisions have consequences. Because decisions have consequences. It sounds like. Uh, Paul's. Would you say his father-in-law or stepfather? Stepfather. Um, he had a lot more belief in the business. What it was very, very generous for him to say, "Yeah, you don't." Yeah, no, it was great. We we named our uh, salesman of the year award after Jack and yeah, gave that, it out worth, every year. And that's worth more than the tens yeah, of man. millions he would have got. <laughs> uh, so, so they say. I hope it is. Um, so, what did did anybody at the company know that you guys were financially just trying to? piece it together with bubblegum and scotch tape yeah well at that time we had like six people so we, everybody, everybody knew, knew everything that, okay. that was going on you. we were all in one room so it was uh, no no phone booths or private it wasn't conversations like that, the naked gun where uh Le was it leslie Nielsen? who's the guy he's like everything's fine nothing to see here and the building's on fire so yeah. no but everybody knew yeah. everybody knew uh, but you guys worked your way out of it what was what was you, what was Massey Knackle's value proposition? But there are other brokers. What was it, other than fairness, right, and the equitability of not being a, you know, in the, in the servitude role at, at Coldwell Banker where some top guy just says, hey, pay me because, I, you know, you're the kid and one day you'll get to do it to somebody else. What was the value proposition of Massey Knackle? What was different about it that, that really allowed you guys, outside of just work ethic, that allowed you guys to uh, compete and ultimately be very successful? It was... Um um, market, it was specialization and market expertise. And so when, you know, I use as an example when I talk about this, uh, early on, uh, maybe we had sold three buildings and we'd be pitching business against uh, brokers that had been around for decades. And uh, we would just be upfront with people, yeah, we've only sold three buildings, but they happen to be the one down the block, the one across the street, and the one right next door to you. We know this neighborhood better than anybody. We can be a better advocate for you in terms of convincing buyers why they should pay more for your property. And our 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 operating proce process is very simple. Our value proposition, we only rep we only sell buildings, we only represent sellers, we only wor work on exclusives, and we only work in your neighborhood. 
and you know that's an eight second spiel, but it's there's no nothing unclear about because that. before that, most agents were generalists, right? They're like, well, you know, I sell a little office, sell a little multi, sell a little retail. You got a building in New Jersey, I could do that. No, you do and buy a rep and sell yeah. a rep, and I'll manage a property. And you want me to rent your store? I'll rent your store. I think up until specialization really didn't become a thing um, until the eighties. Um, the brokers who uh, were very active back, and I, I knew all these guys. I was a member of a, a club called National Realty Club, which was started by Harry Helmsley in the 40s. And they, when I was a kid, the, I'd hear the old timers tell the stories, and the, the good brokers back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they did everything. They sold property, they did mortgages, they leased space. They, there was, it wasn't as highly a specialized business as it is today. Hmm. And that was that was a big catalyst for you. Yeah, yes, you guys were working hard, but that that message resonated with owners. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, it's it was kind of like um, you know you you tear your your ACL in your knee, you're gonna go to the guy who you does knees, knees, elbows, hips, uh, shoulders, or a guy who just does knee ACLs all yeah. day. They go to that guy, and they went to you, and they kept going to you guys, and you grew pretty quickly. You know, again, coming out of that, from six to a couple hundred people. Was yeah, well, two, well the, the first, you know, started in 88. By 9-11, we were, we were at 21. And 9-11 was a big inflection point wow, for that I was going to say that I would, because when you sold, I mean, there were two, what, 250 people? Mm-hmm. So you went from 21 to 250 in the same period of time. Yeah, well, we act, the, the, biggest, the biggest change, Kyle, was... Um, you know, after 9-11, well, we had a couple of inflection points that were really interesting about the growth of the company. Um, we worked on this geographic territory basis. By 1999, uh, we had all the territories in Manhattan filled. So we're like, okay, what the heck do we do now? We want to keep growing, but do we get into office leasing? Do we get into store leasing? Do we do debt? Got to go to the bur boroughs, right? Yeah, got to go to the boroughs. So we said, you know, we don't know anything about those other businesses. We know how to sell buildings. Let's go to Queens. And at the time, Manhattan brokers felt like their shoes would get filthy if they went over the river to Queens yeah. or Brooklyn. And, you know, today the boroughs are like so cool. It's yeah. cooler to be in Brooklyn than in Manhattan. Um, but back then, nobody wanted to do it. We opened up a Queens office. Um, then we opened up a Brooklyn office. Then 9-11 hits. And all of a sudden, every company is downsizing. Uh, we have cl some clients that are selling buildings, moving to Iowa, um, saying the city's going to be bombed. This is not, it's unsafe. And we were like, you know what? New York's the greatest city in the world. It's going to bounce back. We're tough. Uh, you know, th this is ridiculous that all these great quality people are being let go. Uh, up to that point, Paul and I had interviewed everybody ourselves. And we said, you know what? We can't do it anymore. We went out and hired a director of HR. He said, go out and interview all these people, find people that are, are, have shown excellence in their background, have a competitive nature. Uh, we don't care about how they did in school, but you have, to, you have to really like them. If you sit with them for a half hour and you don't want to go have lunch with them or go have a beer with them, you can't offer them a job no matter what they look like on paper. But hire everybody in sight. We went from 21 people on 9-11 to 150 two years later. And it was right at the time after 9-11, you know, by, by, by 02, market traction really started to come back strong. By 03, the market's flying. And we just, we then were beefing up, we're, we're seeding people in Queens and mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. And we had a Bronx division that worked out of the Manhattan office, but we had people in the Bronx. And we were just cranking on all cylinders. And so we, um, you know, we're cranking, the market's cranking, 07 comes along, and CBRE comes knocking. And they offer us 50 million bucks. And I'm like, wow, we got to really think about this. And for a variety of reasons, that deal didn't happen. Um, but what it did teach us was that when we did sell the business, and selling the business was always... In the we, when we started the business, we said, we're starting this business so we can sell it someday. Um, and so in, in 07, we realized 
in the negotiations with CB that we'd be on five-year contracts when we sold the business. So in 07, we said, well, Paul's going to turn 55 in, in 2015. The perception of the value of these contracts is going to be much higher if we're in our 50s than if we're in our 80s. So in 2014, if the market doesn't stink, we should think about selling then. So, of course, we don't do the sale. The, uh, you know, 08, 09 hits. Yeah. We have to fire 25% of our people. Uh, if we had to sell in 09, we'd have been lucky to get a couple of million bucks. And uh, then end of 2010, things start to look a little brighter. 2011, things back on track. We go back, hire all those people mm -hmm. again. And uh, then the market just took off. And in retrospect, you know, we get to 2014, market's cranking, like, let's go hire an investment bank, sell this thing. And uh, in retrospect, it was the absolute perfect time to do it. And people think, oh, these guys were so smart. They sold top of the market. 2014, best year ever in New York City, 5,534 buildings sold, which is an all-time wow. record by more than 10%. So our revenue was through the roof. I think we did $92, 94000000 million in revenue. And is it public what you guys sold for? We sold for $100 million. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, in retrospect, people think, oh, you, these guys were so smart. They sold at the top of the market. The fact is we made the decision to sell in 2014 in 2007. So it worked out in that sense. Yeah. But you guys, uh, you had another one of those uh, close calls during the GFC, right, where, you know, there was – the company had some moments that yeah it was it was tough we had to let people go we had at that point we had our our uh you know sixty thousand dollars in credit cards had uh, ballooned to a two million dollar revolving credit line that we had say, hopefully you still have those credit cards no, no. or I, I hope they had a good rewards program yeah no well you know what i you have fly for free the rest of your life i you have know? not had a, a credit card balance that was not fully paid off since 1998 that's good and now i'm it's a thing with me that I I I 100% payment every month. That's I good. it's I get the Pavlovian shakes when I, I yeah, see a credit you, you, card you uh, lived, you lived, balance. You lived with a, but, some credit card debt for a minute, but um, but so you had this revolving around the credit. You had it pulled. The transaction velocity in, in every product type in every market just gone right. 80. Two two thousand nine transaction volume in New York City was down ninety two percent. I was going to say what was it from its peak ninety two ninety two percent unbelievable i mean it was nothing to do it was horrible uh we had to work out a payment plan with the bank for the the revolving credit line you know revolving credit line you have to zero it out for 30 days every year we weren't able to do that um it was tough and then you know market bounced back again and um you know fortunately by 14 again in, in hindsight and by by sheer luck it was the perfect time to sell what was um how was that process? Uh, you had decided you, you guys wanted to sell the timing. You explained you hired an investment banker. Was it you called all the big shops and said, "Hey, you know, come make us an offer," or was there one that you you really liked in particular? No, we had them. We had them reach out to us. Uh, we had our investment banker reach out to folks, and um, we had eight offers. And the interesting thing was, you know, it, we sold for a hundred million. We had two offers at a hundred. Um, and then, you know, in, when you sell a building, usually the, the meaty part of the bell curve is like 10% below what the building sells for, mm -hmm. and they're, they're tightly packed, and maybe there's one or two at the bottom. Our bids were so sp spaced out. The next high bid was like 82, and then there was a 61 and a 47. That could be because of the, the industry is, you know, I, when you're buying company, you're really buying, you're either buying IP right intellectual property or you're buying ar accounts receivable and in brokerage you don't really have that unless you have you know the, the hey bob i want you to stay and paul i want you to stay and i want all your top people to stay if you're again you guys weren't small but if you're sub half a billion of revenue when you get north of half a billion it's kind of you're so big and chunky it all becomes predictable and the last is people and so i assume any offer had you guys on a stay put where you had to stay and see it out? Yeah, we were on five-year contracts with the original deal with CB. With Got it. With CNW. What, what was the um, what was it like at the office around the time? Did did again when you when there were six people, everybody knew there was credit card debt. But at this point, did everyone know that you guys were considering selling? And 
in 2014? Yes. Well, we had, at the time, we uh, had seven or eight other partners in the firm. There were seven or eight other folks that owned an aggregate of about 16% of the company. Um, and so they were aware of it. We had management meetings, executive committee meetings, people... Uh, people were aware of what was going on. I actually want to spend more time on the psychology of that moment, but when you picked a Cushman and Wakefield and it was hundred million and you go through due diligence, it was New Year's Eve. That was when we closed. Yeah, closing. We signed the contracts and where, sometime probably in uh, October. And they go through due diligence and make sure everything's good. Yeah, they checked everything out. Did a lot of diligence beforehand. I, I don't remember whether there's a non-refundable deposit or anything like that. And I forget how that that worked. But I have to say, Ed Forst was absolutely unbelievable to deal with. He was CEO at at CNW at the time. And, you know, Ed was a deal maker. I mean, he was awesome to deal with. Great guy. Still talk to him every now and then. And um, uh, he... It was uh, it was a really interesting time, but I'll, I'll, I remember very vividly sitting uh, in a chair. I was up at my country house for the holiday, and um, sitting in a chair by the fireplace, waiting for the call because there's a, there's a, a process of, of formality that the investment bankers call and say, "Okay, we're ready to close." The do, day do of? you do you still want to go through with it? And of course, I said yes. Um, and then we got word that, you know, the deal was done and the, the money was received and it was, uh, well, it was quite a moment. So you hang up the phone, it's New Year's Eve, what, five o'clock? Uh, probably around five. Yeah. What happens when you hang up the phone? Like what, what, what are you feeling? Um, a, a mix of emotions, I would say, um, kind of, um, letting go of something that you loved so much and that you put your blood, sweat, tears, agony, ecstasy uh, into for so long was really hard. It was really hard to do. But yet uh, I knew, and, and my wife Cynthia and I, you know, obviously big hug and, um, you know, open the champagne. And, um, you know, but it was, it was a life-changing thing for me, no doubt about it. Um, was- was there, oh, no, go finish. Yeah, first. no, I, I was saying, you know, the, again, we started the business with the intention of, of building something that would make a mark on the, on the market that would, um, that would do great things and help a lot of people, um, and ultimately be valuable and sell it. And, you know, people say to me, well, Bob, you, you must have bought properties along the way. I ne- never did. And it was because every second was spent trying to focus on making the company as valuable as, as we could. It's like if you read Jim Collins' Good to Great, he says that the, all the great companies have this hedgehog concept where they figure out what they can do better than anyone else in the world, and every waking moment, every decision-making process is all focused on attaining that position. And that's what we did. I didn't want to waste five seconds thinking about anything other than making that company valuable. Was it, was it anticlimactic? You know, money's great, but like when you sold, you woke up the next morning and you're just like, huh. No, not not really. Not really. Only because until it was actually done, there was a part of me that always, and Ed was so, couldn't have been more, we're definitely buying you guys, definitely, and unbeknownst to us, they were, were spiffing the company up for a broader sale yeah. of the whole company. Um, but until it was actually done, done, it was hard to believe that it was actually going to happen. Um you know, because again, the impact, and, and we, we signed the papers and we're waiting for the closing. And of course, um, you know, part of me wants to get so excited thinking about what life is going to be like in the, the post-sale world. And um, part of me doesn't want to get too excited because I'm a real estate broker. I see deals fall apart all the oh, time. Yeah. So it was really a, a, in that case where I say a, a real estate deal closing is anticlimactic, this closing was not anticlimactic at all. It was, it That's was funny. a great moment. We'll spend a little more time in the, what the post-closing life did look like, but you, you said something thinking about what the post closing life would look like what did you think it would look like before it happened was it was it you're sitting on a boat drinking champagne caviar wishes no i think it was was more a relief um 
a relief of not having to ever go back to those times when, you know, for 10 years in the, from 88 to 98, my net worth fluctuated between zero and minus $180,000 because I had 180000 in credit cards. And even after the company got off running on credit cards, personally, I was living off credit cards for, for that period of time. <laughs> Did and, that take a, a mental toll on you? Yes and no. I, I, I kind of almost got so used to it that it didn't bother me after a while. I mean, I felt great. When I, when I got back to zero, I felt great. And most You're people like, wouldn't I feel... I don't know anybody <laughs> that's right. anything. That's right. I have no money, but I don't owe anybody anything. Yeah. And I felt great about that. So, um, you know, it's all relative. I think with m- money is an interesting thing. Money is, uh, is more impactful on a relative basis than it is on an absolute basis. I think you, uh, you look at somebody with $15,000 in the bank, and if they had $5,000 in the bank yesterday, they feel rich. And... I have clients today who probably have a hundred million in the bank who feel broke. So I think it's, um, it's just what you're used to. It's, it's, it's all relative. It's it's a relative concept. Um, but that was the, I I think the the most uh, impactful feeling I had was knowing that that I wasn't going to be back in that position again. So like financial. Freedom, right? Uh, financial independence, I think, is what what we call it. It was just, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I was on um, uh, Yona Weiss's podcast, The Weiss Advice, and he said, Babo, how do you describe, what, what does success mean to you? And I kind of thought about it for a second. I said, you know, success means um, achieving a deep sense of peace, and I think that it, the the sale enabled me to do that because I've I've done things with financial planning and things like that that I know my wife and my daughter, who are my number one priorities in, in the world, are, are taken care of forever. Um, we were able to live a lifestyle that, that's comfortable, and um, it just, it's eliminated a, uh, a burden or a concern of mine that was a concern for a very, very long time. And so what happened the day after it closed and you woke up was it, what do I do now? No, no. We, we knew we were on our five-year contracts yeah. at CNW. It was, you know, enjoy, you know, the day or two uh, off and then back to work. What about, all right, let me fast forward. At the end of the five-year contracts, you hit your earnouts, everything's good. Well, uh, no, Kyle, we, we didn't get to the five years. Um, a year and a half into our contracts, right. yeah. um, Cushman decides to bring over the East Dill institutional sales team which was a breach of our agreement. And I don't blame them for having done it. If I was them, I would have done the same thing. Those guys had the, the biggest institutional market share, the highest dollar volume. Because you're, you're just to educate the audience, yours, your average deal size, you and, and Massey, mi- middle markets, it's what? What would you say your average deal size you're well, working on? Well, we, we were doing you know four or five billion a year in sales volume, and that was four or five hundred uh, ten, transactions ten about bucks. ten million yeah. bucks. Yeah. So it was relatively small and, stuff. And a company like East still in our space, they their average deal size might be a hundred million. Right. So it was, you know, potentially uh, a great combination of the platform that had sold three x the number of properties as the number two firm, and a platform that had the highest dollar volume of sales. Uh, and I think it's uh, really a tremendously, tremendously missed opportunity to create something that really could have been great that was management wasn't able to put it together was that just two totally different cultures or well it was the um i think it wasn't the that the cultures were so different it's that the uh the deal itself to bring the east hill guys over was a breach of our contracts um but the east hill guys were given control Mm. um and um, so we renegotiated. We renegotiated our deals from five years to three and a half years. Uh, got a couple of more bucks. Uh, a couple of other things were modified, and um, you know, then shortly after that, you know, Paul uh, took took a leave to run for mayor. Um, my contract was coming up, and uh, we just decided that you know, time to move on. 
in this time. What what did that look like in terms of making the transition to the company you're at today? Because because this is this will be the first time that you and Paul are not together, correct? Right. And and I know you guys are still very close to this day, but how how did that how did that happen? Yeah, no, that was um, you know we were uh, uh, contracts were coming up. Uh, I I wanted a different opportunity. Uh, wanted an opportunity to to kind of uh, run run my own shop within the the structure of a, a larger company. Um, that opportunity was available at JLL at the time. And then similar to uh, Spees and Harmon coming over to C and W, all of a sudden you know JLL was buying HFF. Uh, which led to a uh, you know a a dynamic that had to be uh, worked through, which was worked through. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, Paul wanted to go start uh, another business. I I didn't want any part of that. I I thought that um, you know we've been there, done that. Still vividly remember the uh, the the negatives. You know, it's very easy in hindsight to only remember the good things. Um, and so it's like the fish story. You know, you caught the fish, it was a foot long, and you're telling the story years later, it was three feet long. Um, you know, it's a th- tough times running the business. So um, what, are you, what are you most proud of from your time um, at, as a founder of Ma- Massey Mac? Yeah, w- without a doubt, uh, it was uh, two things. Um, without a doubt, it was the culture that we created um, and I think because we told our HR people, look, you can't offer somebody a job unless you, you, you really like them and you want to go have lunch or uh, a drink with them. Uh, it created an environment where if somebody got married at the firm, there'd be 50 people from the firm there. Um, if, uh, you know, we'd have 20, 20 guys get together and get a beach house in the Hamptons for the weekend or for the summer, uh, you know, uh, four or five families would go on vacation to the Bahamas together. And it was that kind of thing. Like a so, professional family. Exactly. You, you felt like you were working with your buddies. You know, so many people, uh, they can't wait for the weekend because there's a social element. All humans, maybe to different degrees, very much want to socialize and just, talk and be around people that they they enjoy their company and they have a lot in common and and again I'm I'm generalizing here but so many people their their profession at work that isn't their environment but at a place like a hopefully Matthews but at a Massey Knackle it's like uh, yeah I'm a, my friends I work with them yeah uh, we we, inc- we incorporated a social aspect into our our professional lives and that you know we had an annual summer picnic we had a bowling night we went to a ball game with 100 seats. You know, you did things together, so you really felt like you were working with your friends. And that's why, although we're so diffused now uh, in terms of where everybody is, we still get together socially. And there's still, uh, those guys are still among my best friends. So that, that's the one aspect of the two that I'm very proud of. And then the other thing that I, I think is really cool is that today there are 14 investment sales businesses in New York City, uh, either companies or divisions that are either owned by or run by people who learn the investment sales business at Massey Knackle. The Massey Knackle coaching tree. That's it. Very that's cool. it. 14, uh, huh? Yeah, and I think that's great. And still, you know, uh, see those guys around town all the time. It's awesome to see them. It's always a hug and a slap on the back and, hey, how you doing? How's your wife? How's your husband? How's everything going? And, um, you know, that, that to me uh, is, um, you know, emblematic of an environment that allowed people to reach their potential, um, to uh, do better than their best, uh, and to achieve things that, that maybe they didn't think was possible. And uh, that is a really cool thing. And I think that's one of the things that I, I really enjoy about coaching people today is that, um, you know, when, when somebody comes back to you and says, hey, you know, thanks so much. The stuff that you taught me, you know, 20 years ago is just helping me so much today. And it's, it's shocking how people remember that stuff. Uh, but that gives you such a great feeling inside that it makes you want to keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, mentoring, coaching is a, is a lot of satisfaction, phantom income, so to speak, um, in giving back to, the, in this case, the commercial real estate community or the industry, training future generations. Speaking of that, I'm going to ask a question in two different ways. Uh, 
in looking back at all the the agents you've directly, indirectly mentored, uh, coached, guided, advised, influenced, whatever you want to call it, what would you say is the most common uh, trait or characteristic of the ones who ended up doing very well? And then conversely, um, what would you say is the most common characteristic or trait of those who, who didn't ultimately achieve success or, or get to where they wanted to in life? Yeah, that's a great question, Kyle. I think that um, the, the, the characteristics, is not one, the characteristics that increase your probability of success, and I'll say it that way because nothing guarantees success, but to increase the probability of success, it's passion for the business. Um, it is um, having um, significant discipline, uh, and working your tail off, you know, is always the, the people who were in the earliest and stayed the latest always made more money than the people who didn't. And the guys who didn't always said, well, what the heck does he or she do when they're in that early? And what the heck are they doing when they stay so late? And we'd always say, we have no idea, but we know they're making a lot more money than you. And that, that is a direct relation to that. So on the positive side, I think those are the, and the discipline really is probably the most important characteristic of all um, because uh, knowing what to do is not a big deal. Everybody knows what to do. And most of the fundamentals, the blocking and tackling of real estate brokerage, it, it's not a flea flicker. It, it, it is a very simple thing, but you have to have the discipline to actually do it and then to do it over and over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And that's where the disconnect happens. And so I, I would say that the, the folks on the opposite side of the coin, the characteristics that lead folks to flame out are people who are not disciplined enough to do it and to, to actually implement what they know to do. And the second characteristic is... Um, uh, is just feeling like being a salesman is beneath them. I think that there's an underlying thing where um, people may get offended by people hanging up the phone on them or uh, they feel like, you know, being a salesman is not a worthy position. And it's interesting. You know, you could, you could say for what we do, you could say, well, I'm a, um, an equity facilitating intermediary. Or you could say I sell buildings. I say I sell buildings. I'm a salesman. I'm proud to be a salesman. Never had a problem with it. Some people may feel as if, hey, they're being a commissioned salesman, that's the bottom of the barrel. That's, if you think that way, you, you got to stay way away from this business. Yeah, it's not for everybody. It's not for most people. And so, all right, so discipline in terms of positive discipline and sacrifice and working the hours. And then, um, yeah, I, I would say that there is a, there can be a negative connotation with being a salesman or saleswoman. But, uh, but when you're on, the, on that side and you're succeeding, it's a, pr it's a pretty cool job. Yep. Without um, a doubt. It's don't the let best. the secret out. Right. It's the best. Uh, what, um, what, what do you, what do you moving forward? What is it? What does the future look like for you? Um, I, I couldn't be more excited about it, actually. Keep slanging, um, keep slanging real estate? Look, I, I am the, uh, the least tech-savvy person you'll ever meet, and I'm uh, adapting AI applications to some of the stuff I'm doing. Um, you know, for those that follow me on social media, you've seen the NACO map room, and that's kind of a new thing that I'm getting a lot of traction with and having that's a lot of fun cool, with. Yeah. Um, you know, I think creating your own data sets is really important because I think the quality of a, a lot of data sets out there are not so great. Um, so I, I'm just having fun with it, and I, I'm just going to keep going. I, I, I try to stay in good shape, and, you know, um, if, I, if I could do this for another 15 or 20 years, I'll be thrilled. How would you describe, in looking back at your career or your, your mindset, if someone was to say, hey, tell me what, what Bob Knackle is like in terms of your mindset or your mentality? Never been asked that before, but I, I think that... That's why you're here, Bob. The, the people, we ask yeah, the hard-hitting right. questions, right. all right? Well, I think the people around you will, uh, around me, would tell you that, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a win at all costs 
approach uh, because it's not at all costs. It's winning in the right way. But you damn well better win. You better win. I um, I ask this question sometimes, like, you know, I was raised, hey, raise your hand if you want to be successful. Everyone raises their hand. I was coaching the sports, the football yesterday morning, rather. I had my, my group, my receivers group, and I said, hey, how many of you would like to play on the field, like during the game? They all raise their hand. I said, how many of you want to play? They all raise their hand. I said, but how many of you need to play, right? And you need to to be successful, which means you're willing to do anything and everything to be successful. And like, you know, I think they thought they were supposed to, but I was like, no, this is like a real question because if you need something, you will do whatever it takes. You will watch as much film. You will practice your routes. Cause I was talking about like, don't just practice football. The two hours you're here, like go home. If it, if it's that important, if it's not, if you show up, you do it. If you play great, if you don't, why did you need to be successful in commercial real estate? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Don't know the answer. It's, it's just something inside of me. I always, um, this is going to probably not sound so great to the listeners, but I, I always wanted to be the best at what I did. Um, I, I don't know what put that inside of me or why that was the case, but. Were you like that since you were, you know, in diapers? I, I, as long as I can remember. Like if I, if your old man was sitting here and I asked him, I said, was Bob like that? Would he, yeah, even as a kid, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was committed. Yeah. Always wanted to, you know, first one to practice, last one to leave. Um, that was just part of, part of the makeup. And I don't know why, but it, it was there. One of the things we explore on this podcast is, is the conversation that comes up every time is, is it nature and nurture and. And the answers have actually varied, you know, but I think everyone thus far has said certainly nature is a major component and then others have touched on uh, different environments, specifically childhood where there might have been a nurturing component. But for you, it very much was nature then. I think so. Then your nature is to keep going, keep going hard. Yeah, no, I, I tell people and I really believe it. I, I will never retire. I talk for a living. I'm not doing manual labor. It's not physically stressful. It's fun. Uh, I get to, to talk to great people, great clients, interesting characters, and it's uh, intellectually stimulating. Uh, it's fun. It's financially rewarding. Uh, it's the best business in the world. You know, people often ask me, well, if you, if you weren't doing commercial real estate, what would you do? I've never answered that question because it's never crossed my mind what I might do. You got, here's here's the answer. Going. You say, whatever else I'm doing, I'd quit it and get back into commercial real estate. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Ain't that the truth? I, I'm on no argument here. Uh, why wouldn't, uh, let me ask you this. Actually, I don't know how I want to ask this. Is I was going to say, why wouldn't you get into commercial real estate? But I know you're going to say you don't. There is no wouldn't. But what was the worst moment in your career? Like where you, you I'm not saying you ever, the thought ever crossed your mind, but you're like, maybe this commercial real estate thing isn't everything I thought it'd be. Like, what was the darkest moment? I think the toughest times probably were during that SNL crisis. Uh, and then again, 09, just looking at, at stuff. And those are tough times. Those are really tough. And I think that is th those are the primary reasons why I didn't want to start another company again. Um, only because I, I, I didn't feel like I had anything to prove by doing it. Um, and, you know, I remembered what those times were like. And market has been, is, and always will be cyclical. Um, and Like it, right now? You no, know, like right now. <laughs> and, and which is actually... I actually say that in an uplifting way yeah. to young guys who sure. are asking me about it's the market gonna, today. I say, hey, don't worry about it. It's going to get better. It, it has been, is, and always will be cyclical, and it's going to pop the back. Su the sun will come back. Absolutely, up. 100%. Uh, so how did you, um, whether it was the SNL or the GFC, what I think you know, they say absence makes the heart grow fond. I think time makes the pain go away. Right. Um, so try and put yourself back in those moments. How did you deal with the pain of wondering if the business was going to fail or the pain of having to let people go? Like, how did you deal with that? You have to try to compartmentalize that stuff because you can't let it get you to the point where it's impacting your performance. So as, as best as you can, and nobody's perfect at it, and I'm certainly not but you have to try to compartmentalize the, the bad stuff and the tough stuff and realize you have to keep going. I mean, I, 
I used to say at the end of every sales meeting, get more listings. And that was the way we broke every sales meeting was get more listings. And whether times are good, times are bad, things are, are, are positive, negative, you have to get more listings because the only thing that solves all the problems is more revenue. So uh, get more listings. The and best defense is, is a great offense. That's 100%. Right. Yeah, we break our meetings, let's get to work. So we got we to gotta get a little more granular than to say, let's get some listings. Uh, speaking of real estate, I'm, I'm again, this isn't a real estate podcast, So, but anytime I have a, a fellow real estater uh, on the podcast, I always ask the question, what's going on in the market today? Well, volume of sales in New York is down about 70% from the peak so it's been the, tough the peak of like 21 or the peak of 14 peak of 15, 15 dollar sorry, volume yeah. the dollar volume peaked in 2015 um the number of properties sold peaked in 2014 um it's down so what, what was 2021 as as a percentage of 2015 like did that come because 2021 was an incredible year but i know l sp local to new york it was challenging and multifamily because of uh really politics and, and tenant rent rent control, rent stabilization, vacancy control, things like that. Yeah, well, to sum it up, Kyle, I think you, we look at the period of um, the world changed in October of 2015. October of 15, in a two- or three-week period, it was very clear the bull market was over and the market was fundamentally and tangibly changing. So from October of 15 through February of 2020, there was a, an investment sales market correction in New York. Um, the dollar volume of sales over that period of time dropped by 56%. The number of properties sold during that time dropped by 54%. Values dropped by only about 12%. March of 2020, COVID comes along, converts this mostly volume correction into a value correction. Value, particularly in Manhattan, was hit very hard. And Manhattan is always more volatile than the outer boroughs. In good times, it disproportionately is better. Bad times, disproportionately worse. We had three sectors, uh, hotel, land, and retail lost 50%, 50% of their value. Um, and I mean, it was bad. Um, we had a, a shift at the end of the first quarter of 21, um, where the first quarter reports from all of the residential companies came out and showed upward pressure being exerted on residential rents for the first time in years, uh, a good condo absorption for the first time in years. And within a three-day period, I was called by 13 private equity shops saying, Bob, we're coming off the sidelines. We want to invest. Who's building? Who's buying? Who's doing what? We got to deploy capital. And sure enough, um, the the one-year holiday we had from this correction was the second half of 21 and the first half of 22. So to compare calendar year 21 to calendar gotcha. year 22 it, it is, is... What about that 12-month? Uh, yeah. yeah, that 12-month period. I have to get the sales volume for that 12 months, but that 12-month period was very, very positive, and I thought for sure we were coming out of it because... This had been the longest period of correction I'd ever seen. Even the SNL crisis was only four years. This was longer than that. So I said, oh, this is great. We're coming out of it. And then, of course, in March, the Fed starts raising rates. Doesn't really impact the market right away. But by the end of the summer, spreads are blowing out. Downward pressure is being exerted on pricing. And now values are falling again. So... Essentially, we've been in correction mode in New York from October of 15 through today with a 12-month holiday. Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where it is. But it, it is challenging, but there's still deals being done uh, depending on the product. And, and the, the big difference between this correction and whether it was the SNL crisis or the recession in the early 2000s or the GFC is that today different product types are performing differently. The other three corrections, everything was going down. It was just a question of magnitude. That was the only difference. Today, I think re retail properties in New York are doing fairly well, but that's after five years of getting hammered. And Retail's doing well. Yeah, um, retail, uh, rents have stopped falling. 
Leasing activity is picking up. Investor interest is back. Yeah, except for a little high street in Manhattan because of the whole COVID thing. But even then, it's coming back. But yes, your your suburban retail in your you know your best suburbs around the country is doing very well because people have had so much money, right? And they're spending it. Uh, industrial is doing great. Yeah, uh, industrial. Unfortunately, office not so much. Yeah, unfortunately, industrial is such a small slice of the yeah, market it, in New York. It doesn't really move no. the needle that much. Um, multifamily is completely dependent upon policy. And so never before in my career have I seen policy and real estate fundamentals so highly correlated. Uh, But because the politicians can't figure out that to create affordable housing and make make living more affordable for people, you just simply need new supply. You got to let them build. Um, You know, I've had this conversation with the governor where I say, look, all your housing problems get solved with increased supply. Here's six ways you could do it very easily. The problem is that doesn't motivate their base. Their base looks like it's developers. But everything everything the policymakers are doing is exerting upward pressure on rents, which is actually tangentially beneficial to the real estate market. Yeah, and on top of that, the, uh, the law they passed in 2015, October 2015, right, Think about the negative impact it had on their tax revenues if velocity went down 56%, right? Right. I mean, well, in, in New York— And in values. Yeah, the, the real estate industry contributes 54% to the city budget between real estate taxes, transfer taxes, mortgage recording taxes, and other fees. Um, and to not have the real estate sector doing well and not wanting it to do well, you're killing the golden goose. I, I don't get it. Yeah, and then raising income taxes— so whatever they are, 15%, that drives out a lot of the finance industry down to South Florida or wherever they go. Yep, that, that is happening. So, I, again, I'm a believer in New York. I believe New York will come back. Uh, unlike many of my, my colleagues who have gone down to Florida to sell buildings, um, I've stayed in New York. I'm doubling down, tripling down on, on my confidence in the city, and I, I believe it will come back. Where, over the next 12 months, give us a prediction – you know, in terms of commercial real estate, uh, specifically, you know, weighing in on on rates, because outside of New York, that seems to be the biggest dislocate, the biggest cause of dislocation right now. Right. Well, I think rates probably going to bump another time or two and then stabilize, hopefully come in a little bit. Um, I think borrowing will be less expensive when lenders start to feel more comfortable. So spreads will compress a bit. You know, historically, even with a three and a half or a four percent ten-year treasury, it's still historically low. I mean, the the fifty-year average is five point four percent. So I, I don't know that rates are going to fall all that much. Although the government should want rates to fall, given all the debt that we have as a percentage of GDP. Um, but I, I think that in New York, I think that at some point in twenty twenty-four, uh, the market will turn around for everything except office. I think office has a lot of wood to chop. It could be two, three years before things kind of stabilize. Um, I, I think there are a number of things our policymakers can do to help uh, minimize the the negative impact of this period of time on the office sector, but uh, so far that hasn't happened. But I, I feel pretty good about the, uh, uh, the market other than office um, sometime in 2024. I certainly hope it's at the beginning of 24. That would be nice. Not the second. And w- last question, what does the next 12 months look like for Bob Knackle on social media? Everybody wants to know. Well, I'm going to keep at it. You know, I gave it a three-month test, and it's that now, be doing okay. it, it's now uh, you know, August, and I'm still at it. So I, I'm I, gonna... think, I think the young kids would call you an influencer. <laughs> All right. Well, there's something like that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to keep at it, and I have some really cool – initiatives coming out i have a land index uh in new Come york on, you gotta you gotta give us a little little promo a little peek I mean, you can't yeah, tease well, the audience okay well i uh we have our uh, just this week i should be coming out with our development pipeline uh with a summary of every project under construction in manhattan uh every deal that is planned or pending uh, we have our land index coming out, which is going to look at Manhattan land values. Uh, and historically, um, brokerages have uh, said average land is X dollars per buildable foot for last year. Uh, we're disaggregating that into five buckets, residential rental, resi condo, office, hotel, and uh, a miscellaneous bucket. 
uh, for everything that doesn't fit into the first four. Um, we're also applying an AI application to that data to compare um, those fluctuations in land value to several different macroeconomic metrics, which is going to be groundbreaking. I can't believe I'm the one who's doing this when I, you know, I'm happy my cell phone goes on. Uh, and um, I have uh, updating um, a residential study that we did, which we call the Almanacle. Uh, That's which, a good one. Which has cap rates and gross rent multipliers, price per unit, everything in the five in the four boroughs. Uh, we don't cover Staten Island, no disrespect to Staten Island, but that market operates more like New Jersey than New York. But for the four boroughs, um, we're coming out with that study, which was last updated in 2017. Uh, but that has all that data going all the way back to 1984 also. So a lot of interesting stuff we're coming out with on the, the information and data front. And, um, you know, trying to uh, not get run over by uh, AI and technology, we're trying to adopt it and uh, utilize it where we can. So, um, you know, that is invigorating and very exciting and uh, very, very uh, uh, much looking forward to uh, releasing those. Uh, I'm, new looking, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, what, what advice would you have for listeners, like personally or professionally, to achieve what they they want in life? Uh, I think put your mind to it. I think it, it's all about mindset. It's um, taking a step back, working on your business is so important because that helps you figure out where you want to go and then actually implementing the steps to get there and, um, and take heart. You know, I know for a lot of younger folks who are going through their first downturn or started during the downturn, they're, they're really concerned about where things are headed as I said, market's always been cyclical. It's going to come back. And the, the neat thing is that coming out of every downturn, there's always been a new crop of superstars, yeah. whether it's on the building sales front or the financing front or the investing, developing front. There's always a new crop of folks that come out of the woodwork, whether lawyers, bankers, and I'm really interested to see who those folks are going to be coming out yeah, of I always way. say the, uh, the deals come back, but most of the brokers don't because they quit because it gets really hard and deals are hard to come by and the, the money goes down. Sometimes you're not making money, and so a lot of people will quit, and they're like, this isn't for me. But those who stay and fundamentally sound, they uh, they get to participate in what we call the gold rush, which happens usually coming out of it. It's when uh, rates are low, but then uh, the fundamentals return. But again, there just aren't that many agents. So it, 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 we, we definitely see good times ahead. And then for those who are like, well, you know, I don't know what the fundamentals are. Or I don't know where to start. Is there a resource you'd recommend? Something that's a book or some sort of service that has helped you over the years? No, look, I, I, I think that uh, reading uh, and studying things is, uh, is tremendous. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Steve Siegel, who is the uh, chairman of Global Brokerage at CBRE, and Steve told me many, many years ago, he says, just read everything you can, learn as much as you can, uh, I have a great reading list. I mentioned Jim Collins, Good to Great. Um, I have several books that I think are fantastic resources for young people. Uh, anybody listening, uh, email me at bob.knackle at jll.com. I'm happy to share the reading list with you. Uh, but I think you want to learn. You want to learn about, uh, about selling, psychology, persuasion, human behavior, likability, uh, things that are going to help you succeed in this or any sales business. And, um, you know, I think if you focus on those things, uh, work hard at them, uh, you know, the, the uh, opportunities that are available are just um, uh, amazing, almost infinite. And give Bob a follow. I know Twitter, LinkedIn, are you on Instagram? Um, uh, You're dancing I, on TikTok right now? Not on, not on TikTok. I think Instagram, <laughs> LinkedIn, and Twitter – and uh, email me. I'll, I don't know what my names are on those things, but I can get them to you or just put Bob Knackle in. You should be able to get to me. I think it's Big Daddy Bob. Um, no, I'm just jo joking. Uh, Bob, it's been great having you on. It's always a great hang. I really appreciate you coming to town. And um, thanks for sharing your story and, and offering some some really good uh, really good nuggets there that uh, the audience will be able to, to, to hold on to and, and learn from. So, um, Again, it's always a pleasure spending time with you, and uh, I, I, I got to do more deals. I got to catch up to those stats, all right? There you go. Well, Kyle, it's been great to be with you. Uh, really exciting to see your operation. Uh, you're doing great stuff, and, you know, it really kind of 
reminds me of uh, MK. You guys are much bigger than we were, but, uh, you know, it's great stuff, great uh, culture, and you should be very proud of what you've done. I appreciate that. I'm just trying to be like you when I grow up. I just need, I need to get a map room. So let's talk about that. That's Good it. See you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.